Welcome back, everybody, to uh, episode three of the HR evolution or revolution. No matter what way that we're looking at it, we know that people are at the forefront of business today. Um, with a lot of the challenges that organizations are facing, um, HR is being asked to do more, um, sometimes with less. Uh, HR has the wonderful opportunity to kind of take the oppor- uh, the chance uh, to step to that executive table and provide value on a daily basis. And the role of HR has changed more from that tactical administrative function to a more proactive strategic thinker within the organization as well today. Um, I know why I kicked off this passion project with my friend Chris and my other friend Bobby is really that we're fighting for the future of HR. We're revolutionizing the way that HR is um, functioning within the organization today for the evolution of business. And we're all about learning from some of the top leaders like Tashonda Thomas today. Um, We're gonna get into who she is and how she got into HR. But before we do, I wanted to turn it over and uh, have Chris Derone introduce himself. Thank you very much, Kevin. Really excited to be here today with you and Tashonda. And just to reiterate what you said in your opening, you know, the role of HR as continues to evolve and it will continue to evolve as we look at just how work gets done and the future of work. And really what we're, we're trying to do at this series is help HR professionals and HR leaders really understand what are those core challenges we're all facing and maybe learn a little bit about, you know, how we can uh, face off against those challenges and overcome them. So really excited to be here with you today. Kevin, I'll kick it back to you. Awesome, Chris. And uh, you you touch on something very, very important, near and dear that I know that somebody else in this room, Tashanda, is always evolving herself um, and her transition in her career. So Tashanda, without further ado, Tashanda Thomas joins us as the VP of HR, Chief Human Resource Officer of WXXI here in Rochester, New York. Um, she's been prolific in the nonprofit space. I am going to shut up and ask a little bit about Tashanda. Tashanda, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're we're really excited for this. And I'm coming out of the gates hot for you. So I got to know, karaoke night, you're having a big event for WXXI. You're leaning over. You're grabbing the microphone. What song is Tashanda serenading the, uh, the office with? So it may be two artists that come to mind. So anything Mary J. Blige. Oh. So anything from her. And then a edited version of anything Notorious B.I.G. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, man, Biggie. That's, that's New York right there. That's East Coast. Exactly. I love it. I love it. One of the other things that we always want to know, if we had to hear one song cycle through our heads for the rest of our lives... What one song would you pick? That's a tough one, Kevin, because I love MJB so much. Um, I would say anything from her My Life album. So any song off of that album, (laughs) I can listen to for the rest of my life. I've seen her a number of times (laughs) in concerts. She sings the exact same songs, you know, every time. And I jam and rock out like it's my first time hearing it. So anything from Mary J. Blige, if I can't promote that enough, hopefully she hears this and I can meet her one day. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, Mary, you hear that? We got a an avid fan. (laughs) Um, that's awesome. I, 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 I know when nineties music kind of comes Mm -hmm. out early two thousands, it like immediately puts me back in that space, that stage. And now the clothes are even going back to the nineties and and my wardrobe starting to come back in style. (laughs) Exactly. Nineties R and B is everything. (laughs) Chris, what goofy questions you have for Tashanda? I don't know if it's a goofy one, but Tashanda, I think most people, when they think about HR, you know, professionals or HR leaders, they think, oh, you know, very by the book, very kind of straight laced, but that's not true. So I guess if there's one thing about you that people may not know about you, you know, because they just know you as the chief human resources officer, what would be that one thing that you'd like to share with people that they could get to know you a little bit more? I think that I just shared a little when I said Notorious B.I.G. Okay. <laughs> would be a karaoke song. So I'm a so he's my favorite rapper of awesome. all time. And so people may not think that I listen to rap music just because of my job. And, you know, the lyrics and stuff can be a little aggressive sometimes. <laughs> but I always listen, you know, most of the time to the edited version. But, you know, I am a huge rap fan, depending on the artist. So, you know, people like, like I said, Biggie, Jay-Z, Nas. You know, those folks are, you know, at the top of my list. So I, I, you know, I do agree that people think us 
professional HR folks in the yeah. office is who we are also outside of the office. And so if they run into me at like a concert or something, they're like, oh, hey, you know, <laughs> but I still get that side eye, like, what's she doing here? You know, <laughs> enjoy the show like you, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, be yourself. I'm not exactly, judging. Exactly, I'm right. going to bring you in the office on Monday, yeah. you know, <laughs> and don't, you know, don't judge me either because I want to have a good time, you know. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> don't tell <laughs> anybody, no. <laughs> you know, so so yeah. uh, one of the things, too, then, is um, when you're kind of, I guess, uh, having fun um, because you, 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 you work a lot. You went through the pandemic. We're hearing about not only the burnout of the employees, but now we're starting to hear... HR really, I mean, you relied on heavily. You stepped into that role at WXXI during the pandemic. Can you take us back to like, what did you do? What did you do to keep your mind busy during those challenging times? And what was that experience like stepping into the chief human resource officer during a global pandemic? Yeah. So I started January 2020. I never would imagine, you know, my first year here being what it was. So probably about 45 six to 60 days in, you know, the pandemic hit and we had to quote unquote shut down. And I say quote because of the services that we provide, we technically don't ever shut down. But for the most part, a good 85, 90 percent of our staff had to shut down and work remotely. So it was figuring all of that out. Right. You know, I had never done this before, you know, as far as a mass scale of figuring out how to, you know, work remotely, even for myself, you know, what does that look like? Luckily for me, um, our VP slash GM, Sue Rogers, helped me tremendously during this process. And so we partner on, you know, what does this look like for staff? How do we keep services going during a pandemic? We know people, especially during a pandemic, you need radio, you need TV, you need news, you know, if nothing else. Um, So, you know, it, it definitely was a challenge. Challenge, but I was built for it and we got through it. You know what I mean? Um, on the flip side, you know, you couple it with having a pandemic, but there was a lot of race relation things going on in 2020. So me as an African-American female, you know, that was tough as well because we are taught, you know, you leave your personal stuff at home. You don't bring it into the office or to, you know, your work. And we know that we that was out the window last year. If there was ever a year where you could never tell an employee, you know, hey, you know, leave your emotions and what you're feeling outside of the office, don't bring it here. That was the year. You know, we we just could not do that. We knew what was happening outside of the workplace, what's going to impact how people were doing their jobs. Um, and, and especially being that news, you know, TV radio, as I just stated, we're reporting on things that are happening that's going on in the community and the world. So how dare we, right? You know, say, hey, you know, yeah, we understand that's bothering you, but, you know, still get that report done. (laughs) You know what I mean? So we understood how necessary it was to have a safe space for staff who needed to have, you know, a listening ear or a listening session. Um, And so that made us operate a little differently and start to create some things that we thought would be helpful for for our staff. And how did you get the support in HR? Because sometimes you're not given that ear, right? That 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 right. friendly ear. You're you're supposed to be the therapist. You're you're exactly. taking the information. And nobody asks how the yeah. therapist is doing. So what did exactly. who did you rely on during the pandemic stepping into the new role? Was it was it more external to really ask questions on what others in the HR community were doing? It was all of that. So it was my boss, <laughs> um, as well as my network and contacts that I have. So let me back up a little bit. Not only am I new to WXXI, I'm new to public media. So, you know, there are some, you know, public media gurus that I relied on, you know, heavily to see how things were happening during this time at their stations, which was extremely helpful for me. Um, I, I was very... Um, I really wanted to speak to those of color in public media as well, because it is a little different during that year as, again, it related to the race relations stuff, because, you know, we can't even explain what it's like to see folks that look like you that are going through what they went through last year. So I really wanted to tap into those folks as well and just kind of pick their brain on how they were dealing with it because it was really, really heavy. You know, I am very fortunate to have a safe space here at WXXI where I'm listened to, 
you know, people support me here on all levels, you know, here at the station. And, and, you know, they really listened when I was not having one of those good days. Because like you said, we're the cheerleader, we're the champions, we're the therapists. And some days we're, we don't want to wear those hats because it's <laughs> all so heavy. You yeah. know what I mean? It's kind of like, wait a minute, I need to be the patient. You know what yeah. I mean? Today. Yeah. So, you know, fortunately for me, again, I had the support to kind of go through that when there were moments, um, you know, that weren't so, so that were heavy, I guess. Yeah. So, Shauna, I thought you I think you bring up a couple of really good points. Uh, first and foremost, you know, there was no playbook for when the pandemic hit. So, you know, it's kind of all hands on deck and you know, a lot of long days and hours, you know, thinking back to that time, um, which was really kind of interesting at how we looked at what is this going to change moving forward and what is this going to do to how we get work done moving forward. So um, really important points there. I want to kind of still continue with the DE and I just because of like what you said, the pandemic brought about, you know, kind of a new focus on it. And a lot of organizations, I think, were kind of, I don't want to say caught off guard, but they may have thought they had, you know, good DE and I programs in place or policies in place, only to realize that, hey, we need to bring this back up and bubble it back up to the top. My question is, I, I guess, where do you see, you know, progress? Where has progress been made from a DEI standpoint, and then where do we still have more room to go, you know, from a DEI standpoint? So where where do you think we? How did that help us coming out of last year to where we are now, and then where do we still, you know, have to put efforts and initiative you know, forward to help us continue to make progress? So I think you know one highlight or good thing about the pandemic was that it made people go on pause. So we didn't have a choice but to start to listen, uh, you know. No to distractions what was going either. On. Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. So, you know, we had to pause and listen and understand what was going on. Um, D, you know, DEI is not a new, you know, new thing by any means. However, I think it ramped up, the, the pandemic ramped it up, though, to where people were kind of forced in some ways to kind of do something about it. And I will say to your listeners that if you are working at a company or organization that has not said a word about D mm. DEI and belonging, you probably need to revisit if this is the place you should be, quite honestly, because how can you not, you know, at least have conversations about that? Um, for us at WXXI, what we did was it, it triggered us to have a, and create a DEI council. So we are on a mission, which some people may not be aware of, to be an anti-racist organization in our community of Rochester. Because when you hear WXXI, you think of Sesame Street, you think of television, news, radio, as I spoke about, but not necessarily diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some may think, well, yeah, that's a part of the work. You know, you have diverse programming and stuff like that, but we felt we needed to do more. And so we created this council, which is staff, it's, it's board members, it's community advisory members. And we have four target areas. And those areas are capacity, content, structural inequality, and engagement. And so we know that it's important with the things that we do, our work that we provide to the community, that DEI is always a part of that. Um, we want it to become the norm, where it's not where you just got to always have the DEI lens on. It should just be natural in flow in our work. And so I think for us, we see progress because we've done things um, today and it's almost a year old and we still have a long way to go. But I do think we have made some progress as to, you know, how we want to address DEI both internally and externally. I think to your point, to your question, Chris, of how, you know, I feel, you know, we've gotten better as, as it relates to DEI is I think, you know, just continuing the conversation of DEI, because I think what ultimately will be, you know, the game changer is when DEI is not the hot topic and we're still operating and moving exactly. with that lens of DEI and belonging. How do you get it embedded into the, yes. the DNA of the yeah. organization, right? Exactly. That's that's one of those key points that I wanted to say is to Shonda, what advice would you get? Because it's not uncommon that an HR practitioner or leader, right, has this idea or desire to change the culture, right? They know they have an issue, but 
we're talking about something that they are now jeopardizing or feel like they may be jeopardizing their job at that point. And, and a lot of people are not willing to stick their necks out in most situations like that. For the HR leaders or practitioners that are working for some of those companies where DE&I was just a marketing ploy, right, to, 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 to bring a more diverse talent pool or give the uh, appearance like they are more diverse, equitable, right. inclusive, what, would, what tips of advice would you give to them? And what, I guess, what takeaways or inspiration would you give them to, to, to keep evolving and to keep this conversation moving forward? So it's important to definitely have buy-in, right? So um, if that HR, if you report to whoever, the president or a director, whoever that person is, you know, have a conversation with he or she um, and, and try to make them understand how important this is to the business. Um, and if, even if it boils down to you bringing the data into how it can increase your revenue, Sometimes mm -hmm. it takes money. It no. is, you know, whatever. It's funny how that thing changes that. the conversation, exactly. you know? But sometimes <laughs> money moves mountains, okay? Yes, so it does. <laughs> that's the, the lane you have to go to get the, you know, DEI on board and get people to buy in, then so be it. I, you know, hopefully that's not the case. However, it is such an important topic that however you can get that buy-in and that foot in to get, you know, people to start really listening to that you know, go for it. Even if you feel, you know, hey, they make, they're they not listening, they, they're not for it, continue to speak up anyway during those team meetings, you know, just keep that conversation going. But you definitely need the buy-in in order for this to work. You just can't do it alone. Um, one thing that I've promoted with our team is saying, yes, we have a DEI council, but this work is for all of us. It's not just on the council. You know, you can't just say, well, we have a council, so we're good. No, that's not how this works. It really t takes all of us to make this work. Um, I would also say if they are struggling to really get that, um, that support internally to start looking outside. And what I mean by that is to start connecting with other HR people to see how they've done it in their own, you know. You broke down those barriers too. Yeah. And we're talking about something, again, critical conversations, right? You, you yeah. stepping into January, 2020, right? That you had to have a lot of, uh, critical conversations, I, I, I say, right? Um, just for a lot of the points that you just made. One of the things, though, with those critical conversations, one of the other things that you said to Shauna, which I think is vitally important, is buy-in, right? Yeah. How does HR, how do, the, how do you approach conversations with middle-tier managers, senior leadership, and the board to manage all those different expectations but to, first and foremost, I guess, understand what makes them successful or what they define as success to ensure alignment of your HR department. Well, you can start off with feeding them. So bringing food to meetings always work. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Cupcakes work late. Yeah. <laughs> So everybody's happy when they're full, but um, no, seriously, um, you know, so, you know, you, you're going to have tough conversations. And not everybody is going to see your vision on how, you know, changing this or incorporating this into the day to day makes sense. So you are going to have to be ready to, you know, really plead your case as to why this is necessary and to incorporate this into what you guys do. Again, I think data will be helpful for those people that are just not on board, just do not see it, refuse to go there. And you may actually end up just having people that just are not open to this change. And that's when, you know, you need to, depending on their role, it could be very critical because if you have someone in any role, it's a problem to me, but if you have a leader who is, you know, has a, st a team or staff of, you know, however many that is not on board with DEI, that's a problem that, that you know, quite honestly, that is a problem. And so I think at that point, you're going to start to have some really tough questions because it may come to a, this is not a voluntary or you opt in or out, you know, process. This is the direction, strategic direction we're moving in. And, and now, you know, if you're not on board, we need to have some conversations because we need everyone on board, especially at this level. You know what I mean? Um, it's very hard. At least I just think it is. It's very hard if you have someone in an upper level position that is not on board with DEI and, and you think you're going to change the culture. 
I just don't know how that can happen if well, you I have think a that, leader. I, you know? I think you said the da- data, and that's what Chris and I and Bobby and I utilize data to our advantage because it has a way yes. to cut through emotions, which in, exactly. this is a very emotional topic, right? And, yep. and people, do, we know that people are emotional in their roles because they don't even like 360 reviews, right? They love giving, <laughs> they love telling no, people how they're doing, exactly. but they don't want to hear how they're that's doing. Self-reflection, it. right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I can tell you everything. When it's going great, it's me. If it's going yeah. bad, Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Chris. Well, I think to your point, I think to your point, it's 2021. And you know, diversity, equity, inclusion is no longer a nice to have, right? right. It has to be, it has to be part of your business strategy. And the, and there's plenty of, of research out there that shows here's the benefits of Absolutely. organizations that do it well. Right. So that's a great point. Um, let me ask you a question to Shonda. You know, we we watched, you know work change. We mentioned remote working. Now we're looking at maybe hybrid working. You know, some organizations are getting ready to bring people back into the office, um, you know, maybe not full time, but on a part time. In your view and in your perspective, how has leadership changed and what are the key, you know, characteristic skills and characteristics that leaders need to now demonstrate maybe more than they did pre-pandemic levels? Yeah, so I think the pandemic, again, it forced us to be acceptable of the changes that were happening because remote work was so new for so many people. And then it was working with our leaders. You know, how do you manage folks remotely? You know, I don't see them, you know, throughout the day. You know, do we have check-ins? How often do you check it? You know, you can't just allow them to go rogue, you know, quote unquote rogue, you know. So it's working with leadership on that. I think what's important as far as, um, you know, a skill set that they can have is listening. Uh, We know that 2020 was just a rough time for a lot of people. So we pumped EAP like there was no tomorrow. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) for those that don't know, that's the employee assistance program. So there's counseling in that, among other things. So we knew folks needed an outlet somehow. And sometimes they're not always comfortable talking to their leadership or their HR person. So we wanted to make sure that benefit was there. I do know that some folks even went an extra step to EAP and actually had some like critical trauma counseling as a benefit for their staff as well, just because how heavy 2020 was. So I thought that was great. Um, But for me, it's important that the leadership have that empathy and sympathy for their staff. You know, it, it can't be just work, 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 work. You know, again, that had to put a pause on that to say, hey, you know, you really need to tap in to your staff and ask them how they're doing. You know, leadership sometimes is all about the work. Um, and it's nothing about, you know, how are you doing? You're feeling, how's your family? You know, all of that stuff. And it's very hard to connect virtually. You can do it. You know, we use the resources that we have. However, you know, not seeing this person day to day again and in person is very easy to lose that connection. So we had to, you know, discuss those sort of things with our leadership, make sure you're tapping in with your staff, make sure you're connecting on levels outside of work, not digging deep in folks' business or personal lives, but just checking in to see how they're doing, because we know that's going to impact the work. Mm-hmm. When you when you're talking about uh, like the communication, the key factors, the key skill traits, um, Chris is, uh, like he mentioned, it w- has some history in the learning and development space. And we're starting to see new skills, new traits, right? New characteristics. When you're hiring somebody or you're going through that interview process, are you focusing now less on the skills and more on the personal attributes of that individual and their key strengths? Or are you still focused on a, more of a skills based hiring practices? Both. Um, because you may have a candidate that may not necessarily check all the boxes as it relates to the job, but if you know they're trainable, (laughs) you know, they can, you know, you can teach them, you know, certain parts of the job that may not be as crucial, you know, that they have it coming in, you could train them on that. I'm open to that. You know, before I do think, Kevin, it was kind of like, no, they're missing this one skill set. No, we're moving on. No, no, no. (laughs) <laughs> so you could be missing out on a great candidate by doing that. Um, but you can also have all the skill set and the, you know, it just isn't a fit for us though. Yeah. You some know people what are I mean? good actors during you know, the interview exactly. process. And yeah. sometimes you you're not gonna find out to you, you know, that person's in the office with you yeah. and you, <laughs> you know, they're hired. But I think for me, you know, at on the recruiter side, I'm looking for both. 
So I'm looking, you know, can this person fit with our culture, where we're going? You know, DEI is now a part of all of our job descriptions in some way. You know, we'll have some sort of DEI line, you know, in there. And then, you know, I ask DEI questions. And if, you know, they don't know what DEI is or, um, you know, something like that, you know, um, you know, we evaluate that. That's a part of us, you know, kind of talking through, hey, is this a person that's a fit for us? Because all of that matters, all mm-hmm. of it. Have you changed your interview questions? Like yes. besides the DE&I conversation, but have you even, because I, I I always ask, like, what, what are you going to learn as you asking me what type of animal that I would be and why? You know what I mean? It's like, what does that right. tell me on how I'm going to perform right. in that given function? Have you two, besides the DE&I conversation, have you started to change and evolve like your approach in these interviews because of the war for talent right now? I have. So I want to make sure that, you know, the hour or hour and a half that I'm walking away from this interviewing, at least somewhat knowing who this person is and how they would be a fit or not. So, for example, last week, I'm getting ready to hire for my HR assistant position. And it took me literally maybe three hours to work through the questions, you know, first round, second round, final round, you know, because I want to make sure that I'm asking the right questions. I'm not just bringing someone in for an hour and I walk away and I'm thinking, man, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? And, and not to say that you still can't walk away from an interview and you're like, I don't know, you know, but at least I want to have a good idea of their background and their skill set. So I want, you know, those behavior qualities you know, questions in addition to obviously, you know, experience and stuff like that. But I think I'm heavy on the behavioral processes and questions now, you know, you know, how did you handle this when this happened? And, you know, whatever. Um, One thing I did learn in 2020 is they have to be very open to change because when I tell you, I learned that very quickly, my first couple months here, (laughs) you know, know, uh, having, you know, working through a pandemic and if someone can, uh, you know, adapt and and move swiftly and if they struggle with that, that may not work, you know? So yeah, definitely has restructured and reframed how I I handle interviewing now. That's good. Kevin, Kevin mentioned, you know, the war on talent to Shonda and, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the, the great, you know, what do we, what do we call that? The great resignation that, you know, is looking at and the amount of people who are currently looking for new jobs. I think our latest research said, you know, 69% of workers, you know, may be looking for a new job in 2021. Um, and that brings me back to engagement. And you mentioned, you know, part of your diversity council, you, engagement is one of those pillars that you are looking at. Um, so, you know, just given your background, your history, your experience, who, who owns engagement in an organization, you know, and, and how important is engaging your, your workforce and, and what are some ways that you've been doing it, you know, at, at WXXI that you can share with us? So I think all of us own engagement, quite honestly. Um, but as the HR person, of course, they look to us when they have a post and, hey, I need the post for this. So make it happen. You know, give me my stellar talent pool you know so uh <laughs> pull that rabbit out of that hat you know exactly you know so add magician to our list of psychiatrists you know everything else um but i think we all play a part in that chris you know i think you know word of mouth of our staff so if they're enjoying you know what they're doing here the culture and things like that they're going to spread the word um you know it's not bad having you know a tv being at a TV station because, you know, there's small plugs that we can do, you know, during membership drive, they're seeing, you know, more diversity here at WXXI as we have people go on and and do pledges for us and things like that. So I think the visual is helpful to the community of Rochester of seeing different, you know, looking folks, you know, things like that. Um, But, you know, the marketing promotion is always helpful too. So in the community, we want to make sure that we're supporting you know, things like local festivals and, and cultural things in the community that's getting the word out. I think, again, it's put in a different face to WXXI. Like, oh, they're a sponsor for this event? You know, you know, things like that. Um, it's not bad having a chief HR officer who's on LinkedIn and promotes a lot of the stuff that we do, you know, and they're like, oh, okay, you know, things that they may not know about. So I think we all have you know, a role to play as it relates to engagement. 
Um, and we try to make sure with our engagement change team on the council that they understand because engagement can be so broad and so wide, you know, so we want to make sure that we're wheeling it in so we don't get too lost in the sauce of engagement. And so, you know, we work with them very closely to kind of talk through, you know, what makes sense for us to be a part of, but also making sure that we don't forget the engagement of our staff internally mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Tashana almost like biting off more than you can chew, right? Uh, and I, I, I usually consult organizations and HR departments in, in exactly that. It's like it's it's almost too big. Um, let's let's take the bite size. Let's make those micro corrections. Um, but keeping that pulse with the employees on a daily basis is is ever more important in this socioeconomic climate that we're in right now that you had referenced in 2020 and is still here in 2021. How um, are you ensuring that um, when you're having a critical conversation with a manager and communication is the issue, what tips of advice do you give them to properly communicate with the multi-generational workforce? Or how do you reskill or upskill that particular manager to go from a manager to a leader within the organization? Yeah, so if I'm having a conversation with a leader and they're saying, you know, I'm struggling to really get through to this employee, you know, obviously we talk through what the problem is. And if it is, you know, truly communication, um, you know, I want to hear how they're delivering the message because sometimes it's that, you know, and, and then I'll ask them, you know, do, do you ask them or do you reiterate what you're saying or do you ask the employee, hey, do you understand you know, what I'm trying to say here, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, don't ever let your staff walk away confused. That's mm -hmm. the worst mm -hmm. thing you can do. Um, it may be where I figure out this leader could use some training. It may be the leader, you know, the way that they're communicating. And I'm going to use the engagement, you know, engaging with their team, you know, or staff. And so it may be some help that are need, is needed on their part. And sometimes they'll actually ask for it or I'll just see it and say, hey, how do you feel about this? Um, it may be where we have to have a three way meeting, you know, where the three of us kind of talk through the conversation and I'll be that mediator to say, hey, you know, this is you know, what he or she was saying, not sure why, you know, you took it as this, but help us understand, you know, why did you initially feel that way? Um, I think we go back to that empathy and sympathy again. You know, I would ask the leader, hey, are you aware of anything going on with this person? Especially if, you know, the employee responded in a way that is unlike he or she to say, hey, you know, what's going on here? Are you aware of any changes, anything like that? And if they say no, they say, hey, well, I'm going to push back that you go ask, you know, and say, hey, you know, we had this conversation. I just want to check in and make sure everything's OK. And then you can circle back into the conversation you had. I said, because sometimes, again, we can't assume that people are not bringing what's going on personally into the professional space. Um, and then obviously, if it's if it really is, you know, a performance issue, we'll work and talk through that as well. Yeah. Well, I know for me, um, it was really tough building those relationships with staff virtually, <laughs> you know, and I was new. So they didn't know me and they can't even see me physically. You know what I mean? So I had a double whammy there, you know. So I would say, you know, continue to build that rapport because you do want to be that trusted department and resource for your staff to where they're comfortable coming to you for fun things as well as not so fun things. You know, my motto is I don't want to be viewed as the principal office where <laughs> Tashonda is emailing me or telling me she wants to check in. You know, initially staff are like, well, why? You know, what's going on? And it's like, no, I'm just checking in and make sure things are good. And they're like, oh, OK. You know, and then they'll, you know, release the <sighs> you know, but, um, <laughs> you know, so it's like, OK, I need to do this more often with folks because I don't want them to be afraid when I check in. I'm literally just doing pulse checks. Hey, how's your day going? Everything good? You know, I'll tap in with staff if I'm in a meeting. You know, one time I was speaking to an employee and she used the, the term overwhelmed. 
So that's a trigger trigger word for us HR folks. So I immediately circled back and said, hey, just want to have a quick convo, you know, and it was very, you know, light, you know, how are you doing? How are things going? Work good, you know? And so it's those sort of conversations. So I try to do that as much as I can. Um, you know, I am on a mission now to say how, you know, once I hire this HR role, I'll be more able to kind of connect with more department meetings and sit in with those. So my advice for HR folks would be to definitely start to or continue to build those relationships. And I know it's really, really hard during a pandemic or times where you're working remote, but those check ins mean a ton. Oh, yeah. Oh, you understand their definition of success. And I, you're firmly in that category, Tashana, that you're just there to enable their success, make them a yes. better manager, make them a, make them better at communicating with their staff, because at the end of the day, it's going to make their lives better as, as a leader, where they're not constantly feeling like they're fighting fires at all times. And right. they are that therapist that they have those open lines of communication. And again, before it becomes a catastrophic issue, um, six, nine, 12 months down the road. Um, one of the last questions that we always ask our guests is we're talking about the future of work. We know that 47% of the jobs are gone over the next nine years, really putting HR more into that active talent management situation, right? Chris, an expert in learning and development strategies, because we all learn in different ways. It is now a necessity for HR departments to reskill or upskill their current workforce based off the climate, if you will, and the war for talent. What do you see the future of HR playing and where is the future of work headed? That's a really good question. Um, I think the changes are going to definitely keep us on our toes, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get comfortable and, you know, being uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, you know, there may be some situations where us as HR professionals that think we know it all, we'll find out we absolutely do not. And we need to be trained. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, we may start having to look into some coaching and classes and things like that to stay ahead of what's going on. And I try to do that now. You know, technology is a big one, mm -hmm. you know, so I would say, you know, I'm not really sure the direction we're moving in because I do think it's always evolving and changing. Um, but I do know that technology is a big one for me right now where I tend to kind of say, OK, that's happening now in technology. All right. Explain, you know what I mean? I'm constantly, you know, reaching out to, you know, our, our IT department and things like that to make sure that I'm able to do my job not harder, but smarter, yeah. as they say, you know. Oh, so, so yeah. I believe that 100%. And I think technology is there to enable your success in your role, exactly. like, you, like you talked about earlier about needing that, that additional resource, right? So you can be freed up to go play more strategic and build these relationships, sit in on meetings and really listen, right. listen to the organization. And that's what we, Chris and I talk about all the time is how do we get out of that administrative or 80% of our exactly. time in most cases is so we can start getting back to why we got into HR for the people. Right. That's um, right. Start developing those relationships. I've had conversations with people in HR that tell me that they hate people. And that just tells me that you, <laughs> you're not either in the wrong role or you're just beat up over time, right? When you're not valued, you're not listened to, and you're not heard. Right. But to show yeah, that you a hard place to be in, Kevin, if it he is. said that. <laughs> It is. It you, might is. Want to rethink, you might want to rethink your career choices. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that came to my head, but you thought <laughs> I put on the HR hat and just said, well, why? You know, let's start right. diving into it a little bit more. Well, is it because every time that they fill out a piece of paperwork, you got to go to 12 systems? Yeah, I would hate right. people too at that point. Yeah. So that's that's what this show is all about. And I just, uh, I wanted to say thank you from from Chris and myself for, for accepting Absolutely. to be on this show with us. Of course. You, you really have a a lot of great information on the DE and I conversation. And I think it's something that, again, I really don't want to see a marketing ploy by business. I want to see the right. conversation to continue and stay at the forefront so it doesn't lo lose its hot button. Absolutely. Right? Um, and stays at the forefront. And like you said, it has to be a feeling. It has to be Absolutely. something that we're changing within ourselves on an individual level. But you're focused on how you're adding value and showing that through data and conversations and building that rapport within the various parties of the organization. So thank you to Shonda for accepting to be on the show. With Chris oh, absolutely. Today. Thank you for having me. One thing that does come to mind, Kevin, I'll wrap up really quick, is that I do see the way we do business and our work will, you know, it has changed. So, you know, there's jobs now that folks probably never thought would stay remote or could 
you know, actually be successful staying remote. So I do see that, you know, being more of a conversation with us HR folks and our leaders to say, you know, do we need to have this person come into the office? Could they do this job remotely? You know, so, yeah. And that's, and that's the active, active talent. That's why yeah. I always say, look at your, your, practices, your people, your policies in place. I heard this joke the other day for the last laugh of the episode that policies are the scar tissue of bad hires. (laughs) I I (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I think HR is doing the buying, renting, growing or botting talent and they have to understand that those talent pools are constantly shifting too. So thank you again for being on the show. And Chris, any last remarks from you, my friend? I want to say thank you so much to Shonda and maybe, maybe we'll end it with this. All right. So we'll pick one Mary J. Blige song to sum up <laughs> HR. You have, you have a choice of two. Okay. Is it family affair or is it no more drama? I'm going to go with no more drama. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> <Great> awesome. Get <laughs> out of the therapist role and start being the strategist of the company. Thank you so much to Shonda. Thank you so thank much you for having me, guys.